how on earth do you make a custom carbon fiber bike frame? In this video, we are gonna learn how. Now we all know that most carbon frames are made in China and Taiwan, but a few people are trying to change that. 51 bikes have been making incredible bespoke bikes in Dublin since 2016, and they agreed to share a secret to their manufacturing process with us. Our process actually starts with uh, a bike fit, which will normally be done um, in the country of origin. We actually get that information, put it into some software we have here, and that helps us actually calculate where all the various touch points. Once we have all of those measurements, we can actually start preparing the, the raw tubing. So this raw tubing is produced about two hours from here in Cork, just in Southern Ireland. And what we'll do is, uh, with the dimensions we have, we'll just prepare the mitres and essentially make sure that we've got a really, really good foundation. Once we have that in place, we'll actually run a bead of adhesive. So this frame here is actually just at the moment a series of different tubes. It's not actually held together in any way. But the next step will actually be to run a bead of adhesive and create some micro fillets to ensure that all of these tubes become a frame set. And this is an example of one here. So you can clearly see with the bottom bracket there, frame is now out of the jig. And uh, whilst I wouldn't recommend you descend Alpdoez on it, you could probably do a lap of the car park on it. Um, so that's really the first, it's kind of a three step process. So the next step here is we'll actually build up uh, a larger fillet on all these joints just to give us more surface area and greater strength. And then most importantly, then all of these joints are then wrapped in carbon fiber. Here's a frame here that's been actually wrapped. So you can see all this pre-preg carbon here, which is the third part of that step. This frame has just been recently wrapped and he's actually putting some peel ply around all the joints now in anticipation of the bike being vacuum bagged and then cured. And what this material will actually do, it'll suck out all the excess epoxy. So all the, the epoxy, that surplus to requirements, uh, allow us to keep the weight down but ensure that we have all the structural integrity and make sure that we have the co-molding taking place. Um, and the next part of the process for this is this will actually be vacuum, vacuum packed and uh, cured in an oven. And uh, all of this carbon then it's essentially co-molding so it'll, it'll all uh, become one. We've introduced the frame um, basically into a, a vacuum bag uh, and this will now be introduced into the oven. So we're basically using pressure and heat to give us that co-molding solution. How long that's been in the oven then? Can't tell you. That's the one thing I can't tell you. Temperature? Can't tell you. <laughs> so this is our paint prep room. So typically a frame will come, as it comes out of the oven, comes in here, gets some prep done before it goes into the uh, spray booth above us. And this one's actually painted, um, probably just waiting on a final lacquer for some finishing work. So it's quite an elaborate design, as you can see. This is based on a client's requirement to mimic uh, an old Van Halen guitar. So I think he's going to be pretty happy when he sees it. How many hours would typically go into a frame like this? I'd rather not count. Um, when everything goes right, it's probably not too bad, but you know, we are in the business here of almost rapid prototyping and that we never, we never repeat this design. So if we had to do five designs now, the guys would say, oh, well, next time we do that, we, it would be so much quicker and so much better if we did it this way, this way, this way. We never really get that luxury. Um, so that's the business we're in, I suppose, of creating one-off one -off creations. But the real pleasure comes from seeing it on the road and maybe, you know, when the client starts to send some pictures in and things like that, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty exciting. I, I wouldn't, I'd rather not count the arrows. <laughs> <laughs> and here's one we've made earlier. So here's obviously a frame that's completely finished. It's come out of the oven. It's been prepped for paint and it's gone through the paint process. So with this one here, we've actually um, we've tried to highlight the craftsmanship and keep the carbon weave apparent, particularly in all the joint areas. And also the main logo um, from a distance may look black, but it's actually the, the weave of the carbon fiber that's apparent. Obviously, we do our best then to integrate the entire design. So here, obviously, we've got the fork to complete the frame set. But we've also custom painted the bars, stem, seat posts, which is behind me, and all the various little things we're going to need, um, garment mounts, spacers, etc. So it just really brings the whole design together. Here's an example of the finished product. This is actually my own bike, produced some time ago now. But it'll give you an idea of uh, our general ethos. So round tubing, um, just in terms of comfort and um, displacement of vibration, it's very, very hard to beat a round tube. Threaded BB, so we use that um, titanium insert that we showed you a little bit back um, to give us threaded cups. 
So uh, if that BB needs to be serviced, it's very easy to put it, take it out, put it back in. For someone like myself who probably needs a, a larger frame, if you're to take maybe a stock offering, it's not quite as slick as you see the 54 centimeter that's often pictured in the, uh, in the website still. So we've come up with a few ways um, to make larger bikes look a little bit more elegant. So you can see we use quite a discreet little seat tube extension here. So we've got about 30 mil of a seat tube extension, 25 mil on the head tube. And we've also raised up the, uh, the down tube here where it meets the head tube. We've raised this up as well. So just aesthetically, just giving you a far more kind of um, pleasing uh, frame. It's probably something more akin to maybe a 57 centimeter frame when in reality I'd probably need something closer to a 60. Weight isn't something you uh, concern yourself with? Well, it, it is obviously, but I think in terms of priority, comfort is absolutely number one. Um, so, you know, a, a raw frame before paint probably weighs in the region somewhere in about 850 grams. Um, as you've probably already seen, we like our paint and we lack our, our lacquer. So that can add quite a bit of weight, but typically somewhere, somewhere on the 900s um, is where the finished frame is going to end up. Um, making these ultra light frames has never really been um, a motivator for us. It's always about um, comfort. And at the end of the day, we're building something that has a lifetime guarantee and uh, hopefully it's going to outlast us all. So it's important that we build that into the product as well. Most carbon frames are made in the Far East, Taiwan, but you decided to make them in Dublin. Why? I think the idea, um, Taiwan is fantastic if you want to mass produce something, if you want to make, you know, um, huge quantities of the same item. It's probably no, nobody better than Taiwan stroke China to, to do that type of thing. But what we do is completely different. We're building custom bespoke frames. So no two frames that we've ever produced have been the same. So the geometry is completely uh, custom and the kind of writing characteristics that we build into each frame is diff are, are different also. And then of course there's the artwork which we, we kind of co-create with the end user or with the client, a unique set of uh, artwork for that particular bike. So there's just very little scale, if any, to what we do. So um, we may as well be doing it in Dublin. I think the, the barrier to entry uh, with carbon is probably higher. There's a little bit, you know, different skill sets, etc. But for me, it was the obvious choice. So I grew up racing, all my bikes were custom. Um, and for me, it's always been a little bit strange to see people spending, you know, 15, you know, a lot of money on, on stock geometry bikes that they pull out of a box and just simply don't know if we're going to suit them or not. When the reality is for, uh, well, it used to be marginal upcharge, now I don't even think it is. Um, they can actually go and have something bespoke. Um, so, like I said, all of my frames when I was growing up and racing were custom, but they would have been steel and aluminium. In the later stages, aluminium mixed with carbon four, carbon rear stay. But I think given where we are now and the qualities of carbon fiber, for me it was the only option, yeah. I get the whole steel, uh, you know, revival and I, I, I think it's great, but I think when you just look at the, the, the qualities of carbon versus anything else that's out there, it's, it's a no-brainer. Why do you think there aren't more people like yourself making custom carbon frames in the UK and Ireland, if you've shown it possible? Yeah, I mean, I think there could be a revival. I don't see why not. Um, for, for a long time, first of all, if, if we go back, well, go back to the beginning of time, like all the pro riders rode custom frames. So we're actually in a very bizarre moment in time now where the best riders in the sport are not necessarily using the best equipment. You know, we're starting to see riders use these crazy 140 mil stems and negative stems simply because the, the products that they're, they're given are just simply not apt. Um, uh, and that's, I, I can't think of any other sport or, you know, it's not something we see in motorsport, for example. So it's a, it's a little bit strange, but for a long time, the difference between stock in terms of pricing, stock and custom was just huge and most people couldn't justify it, quite rightly so. But those days are now gone because I think with, with so many boutique brands and bikes routinely selling now for, you know, 10, 12,000, it doesn't matter if it's euros, pounds or dollars, um, that barrier to entry wasn't there anymore. And that was kind of one of the kind of green lights in my head. The other thing was, I think just, I think, in general, people are moving to a more kind of 
a slower, more sustainable way of um, sourcing goods, purchasing things. And I think if you spend the time to create something that's built for you, um, you know, you'll have it for life. There's no model year attached to it. It's not going to be out of fashion in nine months' time when that red stripe gets replaced by a pink stripe. Um, you're creating something that's going to stand the test of time and that will outlast both you know, the end user and indeed us. So I think that's kind of special and I think that's coming back in. I think people have an appreciation for that, I think. I mean, our, our bikes are expensive, so let's, let's get that out there straight away. But I think they're on par with, a, you know, for example, a Dogma. You know, so if I were given the choice to, to buy something off the shelf that may or may not suit me, um, or something that's actually built around and specifically for me, I know, I know which way I would go. When people come to you, are they after the custom geometry or the custom finish or a bit of both? I think it's a bit of both. I think the emotional side of things, people are drawn to the artwork. Um, I think there is a little bit of, uh, I don't know if you would say misinformation, but a lot of people think, oh, well, I don't need a custom frame because I'm five foot nine or whatever. That's not really what it is. But we're not, we don't spend our days building bikes for, you know, basketball stars. And, you know, that's not how it works. I think it's just about tuning fine details. And a lot of people overlook the fact that you can actually um, fine tune the bike and the, and the characteristics of how you want the bike to handle, how you want it to corner, how you want it to descend, all those things which we, we just simply can't do um, with, a, with a stock geometry bike. Bike fitters do the best they can with a stock geometry bike, but really they're, they're limited. All they can do is move the saddle up, down, fore, aft, and maybe swap out a stem. Um, whereas our process is completely different. We talk to the bike fitters before they even meet the client and it's, it's worked backwards. I mean, that's the way it was traditionally done. And with the finish, anything possible? We don't have a, a limited set of options. Yeah, we work hand in hand with the client in each and every design. And we've got a very transparent pricing structure as well. So that was important to me. Even when we started, we wanted people to be able to compare, uh, you know, our finished result or our services versus something that, you know, some of the bigger brands, etc. cetera. Um, so the custom geometry and the custom paint is inclusive. And um, we, we work with the customer. Most clients um, are intrigued and are interested in custom, but don't really know what they want. So we've got a pretty much a foolproof funnel or a plan or strategy, call it what you want now, that people go through, which just helps validate what people like, what they don't like. Um, and we'll get to a point where we have a, a direction or a theme in mind. We'll create some drafts. And once we get to that point, we have a visual aid. It's very easy. It's very easy to go back and forth and say, well, that's not quite what I had in mind, or that's amazing, or let's change this or whatever. So that's normally how the, how the system goes. And um, it's a bit like falling in love. You know, we keep going until the client sees it and like, boom, yeah, that's it. So, yeah. Anything like, no, can't do that. It's too late. No, I mean, I think there are some brands that do that and they have very strict protocols around, you know, what they will do. Um, but I, I take the view that, you know, we're, we're so um, grateful and we're in a, such a fantastic position that people want to do this with us. Who are we to say what they can and can't do? We may or, not, may, or may not decide to, uh, you know, put it on social media or whatever. There, there are certainly some that I appreciate more than others. But at the end of the day, it's, it's the clients who, who create and we, we simply hold our hand through the process. So you recently launched the Assassin, your first gravel bike, and that's different in terms of like it's made in Taiwan. Yeah, I, I always envisioned this this hybrid model where we would have uh, the majority of our manufacturing is done, as you know, in in Dublin. But it's somewhat exclusive when it comes to price points. You got an idea yesterday how labour intensive that is, and uh, if you know you ring me on Monday morning and say, "Great news, Aidan! I've, I've got fifty custom frames here sold." Well, that's somewhat of a problem because we're a compa capacity, uh, you know, led, led business. There's only so much custom stuff you can do. That's number one. Number two, from a client point of view, it was somewhat exclusive. And I kind of mean that in a negative sense. Not, not everybody. I mean, if I wasn't working in 51, would I have a 51? Probably not. So the, the idea to outsource something and have a more attainable price point was always something of interest to me. But only if we could kind of bring our own DNA into it. The obvious choice would probably have been a road bike, but um, I was just really excited about the, the, the gravel category and the gravel scene. And I also thought that our, um, our learnings from the custom world um, could help us to, to create a better product. Uh, as an example, going back a few years, one of the big taglines to help sell gravel bikes was that you could swap between 650B wheels and 700, right? And that was, you know, oh my goodness. But 
to, to a frame builder and, and you know, the, the characteristics of the bike are, are, ch are changed quite dramatically when you do that. Um, so the chassis is either built around one or the other or is a, a compromise of, of, of both. So that's when we came up with the idea of the, the variable geometry system. So flip chips are nothing new. We certainly didn't, didn't invent them. We originally started to see them in downhill mountain biking for suspension setups. And they have been used in um, probably more so on the mountain bike side of things. Um, but they essentially gave us the ability to adjust the geometry. So the overall wheelbase, chainstay length, and the, the fork trail. And of those, we spend our day um, like I said, adjusting or making, uh, you know, custom custom geometry frames. So of all of those things, fork trail is probably the thing that determines more so than anything else. Of course, it's a combination of all these things together, but fork trail really determines how a bike corners, how it handles, how assertive it is, etc. cetera. Um, so that chip we have on the front of the Assassin allows you to set it up for more kind of road-like um, tendency or actually to push that wheel a little bit further out you again give, giving a little bit more stability if you're riding more mountain bike trails or if you've got a lot of cargo a lot of weight on the bike you might want that stability as well so same thing on the rear it's got three three different settings on the rear so we basically built that bike with just versatility in mind i think the the bigger brands and the industry as a whole there's nothing like a new category to create additional revenue right but I just think from a sustainable point of view and a, for me as a consumer, I'd rather buy one thing that can do a lot more things so I don't have to go back to the shop and say, oh, I'd like to fit mudguards. Well, I'm sorry, you can't do that. You're going to need this bike. So all those little things, we've tried to just um, take them all and uh, adapt the bike from the get-go for them. So my dates are a little bit sketchy, but we produced this for one of the NAB shows, which is the, um, the handbell shows in the US, I think around 2018. And this was basically a tribute bike. It was based on one of the Bianchi bikes that Evgeny Berzin used in the Giro and Tour de France. And then we thought, well, how crazy would it be if we took that, uh, you know, Celeste Blue um, Bianchi design and actually combine it with the kind of Brooklyn 1970s jersey, just to kind of throw people. Um, we did obviously the matching Silka pump as well. And uh, it went down pretty well. Most people, I think, thought it was a kind of a tribute to the kind of maybe US uh, flag. But um, it was just a combination of those two things, just to try and get people to understand that, look, when it comes to custom, anything is possible. We're in around the car park, so uh, it seems, seems pretty fast. Actually, uh, the guys in Z Zip Shram uh, took it, I think it's been to Kona. So it's actually never ridden, uh, but it's been to Kona and it's been to, I think, many, many uh, Ironman events around the world. So much so that uh, I doubted we were actually going to get it back for after about a year and a half after the show, it arrived back uh, safe and sound. So uh, yeah, it's done, it's done a tour of the world.